Okay. Welcome everyone. It's 8.30 p.m. Welcome to the Conscious Contact speaking group with Doylestown. We do have a couple announcements and uh, well this group uh, has, a, has a really powerful antenna. We picked up a transmission. It said, Houston, we have a problem. Phillies won the first game. First game. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're up against the uh, Phillies tonight. There was a mix up in speakers. I don't know, I just got a call now, whatever story. It's, this happens very rarely. Uh, so what we're gonna do on this Halloween uh, party is just to do a rotation of, of some different people here, okay? So we'll fill in the gaps. Let's keep it down back there. The meeting has started. Thank you. And uh, what we're gonna have to do is fill in the gaps. We'll take a rotation of a couple different people and get a little uh, cross section of our members and whoever it is so there's no set uh, talk. We've done this many times before and uh, it always turns out to be a lot of fun because we never know what to expect uh, you know, with random alcoholics and, and your boredom is uh, guaranteed not to be uh, had because you will have a rotation going on. Uh, we will have New Year's Eve in here. It happens every seven years on Saturday night. New Year's Eve party, killer party, Robbie W. Chris S., more speakers. We will have an open mic here again. It'll be from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Everybody gets five minutes. It'll be 12 different speakers. That'll be fun. And it'll be a party. We're going to run it until, until we run out of gas at midnight and whatever hours that's going to be. So that'll be fun. Also, every seven years, Christmas Eve falls on a, on a, a Saturday night. And we will again have a festivities going on here. Hopefully, we won't be up against the Phillies then and we can get back to normal. Uh, meetings and people showing up and doing what they're supposed to be doing and having fun. Anyway, with that in mind, just be mindful of uh, the party after the party and let's start out with, Nick's going to come up here and share it and then we'll get picking off some speakers. Harry? Good evening, my name is Harry, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Welcome to Conscious Contact Speaker of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Nick and I am an alcoholic. Amen. This is a one hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday evening at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Food and fellowship starts at 8 p.m. followed by our speaker at 8.30. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday at 7 p.m. to 7.30 right here. Please come early and join us. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. And this is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? Yes, sir. Hey, Jim, welcome. Ted, alcoholic. Hey, Ted, welcome. I'm an alcoholic, my name's Gabe. Hey, Gabe, welcome. Yes, sir. Frank, alcoholic. Hey, Frank, welcome. I'm Angela, an alcoholic. Hi, Angela. Welcome. Hi, Susan. Welcome. Hi, Jim. Welcome. Hey, Trevor. Welcome. And welcome to everybody. The Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor please raise your hands? Are there any announcements from the floor for the good of AA? Yes, Dave. Hi, I'm not calling him Dave. Dave. <laughs> so there is a uh, little mini conference going on November 12th <coughs> in Philadelphia, Academy Road. Um, there's going to be seven speakers. They'll run from 10 to 6, and they'll be uh, walking us through the steps. If anyone is interested in more information, I have a digital flyer that I can share with you. Again, that's Saturday, November 12th from 10 to 6 in Philadelphia. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Jason. My name is Jason Rappaport. Hey, hey, Jason. I'm also the assistant director of Bucks County Prisons, and we're always looking for people who are interested in carrying a message of help into the jails. Um, if you're interested or you want some more information, you can see me after me. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> Our sister group is a big book study meeting that meets every Thursday at 7.30, just up the street at the Salem Church. Coffee starts at 6.15. We have, a meet, we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or a hymn group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. 
anyone willing to make donations for people who can't afford them for the purchase of big books and CDs uh, is a jar on the tail marked back there marked um, big book and CD donations. The CDs are available free of charge. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and our Facebook group. Subscribe and share. You can find our speakers there. Join our Facebook page to keep informed and share uh, upcoming events and meetings. Uh, and now with that, I have Michelle to come up and read the AA preamble. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. I've asked Karen to come up and read the AA 12 Steps of Recovery. Hello everybody, my name is Kara, I'm an alcoholic. Kara. Hello everybody, so good to see you guys. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Number one, we admitted we were prowless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Number four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do would injure them or others. Ten, Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, properly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And number twelve, having had our spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Now Nick will come up and continue. The seven tradition. Every A group ought to be fully self-supported in declining outside contributions. At this time, I'd like to pass the basket. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses. This group provides many services, and your donations cover food, rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops. There is absolutely no smoking on church property. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and try to limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. Now, let's introduce our first speaker, a wonderful uh, member of our home group. Tonight we're going to start out with Kara. Good evening everybody and welcome. My name is Kara. A lot of you guys know me. Um, I'm, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Hello, everybody, and it's so wonderful to be here, and it's so wonderful that I was able to be here and clean and sober. My anniversary date is 10-24-2013, uh, uh, um, 2000, uh, so I've just, celebrated, I've just celebrated my seven-year sober anniversary on Monday. Thank you. Um, but as you guys know, we just have today. And um, this is just a wonderful program. It brought, I came in here, I was in a lot of pain. I had a lot of self-pity, a lot of just anger. A lot of things happened to me. 
but this program and God has taught me how to live again. Nothing has ever worked except the spiritual principles of this program. I am spiritually fit, and with that meaning, I am here and I do everything for God. I have good days and I have bad days, but there's never a day bad enough to pick up that drink. I never want to go back to that awful place that I was in seven years ago. Seven years ago, I didn't like myself at all. I couldn't look in the mirror. I had the laundry list of a lot of things that we all do. Hiding the booze, getting caught at work with the booze, being escorted out of my pharmaceutical company, escorted out because they, they smelt booze on my breath. When they escorted me out and drove me home, my car was the evolving bar. I lived out of my car. I never want to be that woman again. I never want to be a not a good mother, not a good friend, not a good employer. So what it took for me is to get right sized. Getting sober, I went to a rehab down in Florida. I'm from Louisiana. I wanted to see my two children. My children were at Tulane University, so I chose a, a rehab down in the South. That got me sober. But really when the work started was when I accepted God back in my life and started working the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Starting figuring out what is wrong with Kara James McMullen. I had to overcome my shortcomings. I had to tell, give my amends to my children. I had to give my amends to my work people. But today is a wonderful life. I'm not only seven years sober free, I just, just experienced 13 years breast cancer free. So it's a wonderful life that I live today. And it's all because of these 12 steps and the spiritual principles and I live my life by them every day. Thank you. <clears throat> Powerful stuff. Um, now we'd ask Dave if he'd come up and talk for a few. Please welcome Dave. Hey everybody, I'm Dave and I'm an alcoholic. Hey. I'm grateful to be here. Good to see everybody tonight. Go Phils. Uh, um, yeah, I've been around for quite a while. Um, I suffer from alcoholism. I don't suffer from alcohol. Alcohol has been removed from me a long time ago. I still got problems, you know, and I need to come here. Um, I need to have a sponsor. I need to sponsor other men. I need to do the work out of the book. Um, the book talks about having a complete psychic change. You know, and that is what I continue to work on every day. Um, I came in back in 1989, age 25, hated the world, hated myself, and uh, alcohol fixed things for me until it stopped working. And um, I went to a rehab. That's how I found you people. You know, I didn't, I didn't know about AA. It was, I thought it was something made up on TV. I honestly didn't think it was real and uh, got introduced to you guys in the 12 steps. And um, I started doing most of, man, most of what was, I was told. Um, you know, I still had old ideas on a lot of things. I, um, I got real involved. Fellowship kept me alive and sober for a long time. And um, I didn't really do a lot of step work. It wasn't pushed a lot back then. And, um, and I suffered for it. My, I lost the marriage. Um, just my whole world fell apart. And, uh, and I came back here. You know, at that point I was about 16 years sober. And um, finally did the work. Like all of it. 
complete one through 12 in order with another person as honest as I could. And I absolutely got lit up, you know, and just fell in absolute love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, but the book tells us we need to be vigilant. And just shy of 20 years, I relapsed. I uh, had uh, lost that relationship with a higher power. I never really had one. I, I see that you had a relationship and I lived on that. You know, there was a lot of fake it till you make it. And I, I knew that there was something. I just didn't have that personal relationship. And, um, and I needed relief and, and I picked up a drink. Um, but you wonderful people would call me every day. And nobody was calling me and telling me I needed to do another fourth step. You know, you need to go back to the beginning, get back to the basics. All they said was, we love you. You know, like every day. And I was like, <laughs> you know. Um, tried going to the bar. I was like 45 years old and I'm walking in the bar and all the little 20 somethings would turn their head and say, hey, somebody's dad is here. Um, you know, you guys were all I had, like you were, and I, and I came back, you know, because I know that this works. I could see it for 20 years. I've watched miracles happen every single day when I walk in these rooms. So I had to find what was missing, and, and for the past little over 13 years, that has been my mission, is um, that personal relationship, that 11th step, and, and how can I best serve my higher power, because I have one today. Like, I have my God today, you know? I um, had to move God out of my head and into my heart. I had to stop being a noun and became a verb. And I put that in action every single day, you know? Um, wherever I am, wherever I am, I'm, I'm trying to give back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I could never possibly repay the gift, the debt that was put on me twice, twice. You know, um, so that's what I work towards is just trying to do the best that I can, you know, and, and, you know, like we shared, like not every day is great. I falter, you know, I surround myself with enough people that I don't fall too far, you know, and, and they pull me up and I pull them up. Um, you know, we all kind of like sponsor each other, so to speak. And, um, even though in the bad days, it is so much better than when I was out there, you know? I would not, I would not trade for, I wouldn't trade what I have today for anything, you know? Uh, I'm just, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, I'm grateful to see all you people here. Uh, my biggest fear is that I'm gonna show up in rooms and I'm gonna be the only one, you know? <laughs> like everybody else is good and it's just me because I'm that messed up, you know? So thanks for being screwed up with me. I appreciate it. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, my name is Ryan. I'm an alcoholic. And, and, and I just like to apologize again. You know what the amazing thing is about Alcoholics Anonymous is even like no one speaker is that important in AA. You know, whatever, die, old, drink, pick up, somebody else fill that gap in. Uh, I always like to look for somebody new, and, and Frank said it's his first time at this meeting, and he showed up in a sport coat, and, and we got to hear some, something from Frank. Let's welcome up here. Frank, come on. My name is Frank. I'm an alcoholic. I did not expect to be speaking tonight. <laughs> I remember the first time that I was asked to speak, I was probably about uh, four months in this thing, and, uh, and my sponsor asked me because he was celebrating. I was like, Jesus, you know so many people here. Can't you get someone else to do it? And he taught me that you never say no when you're asked to do something in AA. I said, well, how long I got to talk for? He says, probably about 10 minutes. So I went home and I wrote down 10 different things. And I figured I'd spend like two, maybe three minutes on, on each one of those topics and 10 minutes would fly by. So that's what I did. And I got through the 10th when I looked at the clock and like two minutes passed, you know what I mean? And I was like frozen up here. I was frozen up here, but it does get, uh, 
it does get easier uh, the more you do it and, and the more time you got. My sobriety date is October 18, 1993. So a couple weeks ago I celebrated 29 years. My, my, my uh, sobriety lineage is, is linked to Doylestown. It's linked to Doylestown. I got my uh, first exposure to, to AA as a result of being uh, sent to a rehab when I was 21 years old. And walking into that rehab, I was asked, are you an alcoholic or a drug addict? And I said I was a drug addict. Okay, I hated the sound of that word, alcoholic. You know what I mean? It was like leprosy. But while I was there, I heard things and I learned things and I realized I was indeed an alcoholic. You know what I mean? Now, that didn't keep me sober. I got loaded that night that I got out, but the seed was planted. So I not only learned that I was alcoholic, but I also learned that there was a solution. You know what I mean? Ended up moving out to Los Angeles and out there uh, got into trouble as, as I always did. And, and uh, I would pick up the phone, directory assistance, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was always a meeting right down the block or not too far away at all, you know? So I got this job out there at this Buick agency, and, um, and there was this young fellow from Philly there, Jimmy Kelly. And uh, this is back in the early 80s, long hair, rock and roll, I was into that whole scene. And he was a very clean cut, yuppie type looking dude, but we drank the same. So we gravitated towards each other. We became instant best friends, you know? So back in the 80s, one of the hottest cars on the street was a car made by Buick called the Grand National. So one night I liberated one off the lot and I kept it for three days. <laughs> so the manager tracked me down, okay, out of concern for me, but I think he was really concerned about getting this car back. But he had told me, he goes, listen, I, when I was younger, had a problem with alcohol and I was able to address that problem through AA. Now, if you come back and agree to go to AA meetings, you can have your job. So I agreed to that. So it turns out that right directly across the street from this dealership was an AA clubhouse. And like the windows were all waxed out. There was no signage or anything. And I would watch people go in and out of this building like every day. Thought it was like a methadone clinic or something like that. I had no idea it was an AA clubhouse. So when the dealership would close and all the employees would pull off the lot, I'd get back out of the car, walk across the street to this meeting. I'd show up late, I'd leave early, I'd speak to nobody. So I'm doing this for a couple of weeks and, find, like, and Kelly's coming to me every night. Come on, let's go out, there's happy hour here, there's happy hour there. I'm like, nah, 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 I'm trying not to drink, you know. And that, he finds out I'm going to AA and he just like kind of grabs me. He's like, are you going to Alcoholics Anonymous? And I says, yeah. He goes, it's a cult. Those people are crazy. They're going to brainwash you. Frank, you're not an alcoholic. I said, I'm not. He goes, no. Your problem is all the drugs you do. I said, you think? And he, I, I, he says, yeah. And I said, okay, let's go have a drink. And I was off to the races again. Now, I probably tried to get sober three or four more times while I lived out in California. And uh, often when I'd get in a jackpot, I'd call this fellow Jim Kelly. He'd come bail me out or what have you, you know. And... Um, my drinking led me to Texas, to Texas, and going out there for this job, I knew I had to stay sober to secure this position. And I started going to AA in, uh, in, in Texas. And within three months, everything that I had lost, I'd gotten back. The car, the house, everything. And I'm driving home from work on a Friday afternoon, and the thought popped into my mind, I could have just a couple. And then it was off to the races again. Lost a couple of jobs down there, got locked up a couple of times down there, and uh, I had this one job at this lecture shop, and my, uh, my, my, my sales manager called me into the office and goes, Frank, you're late every day, or you're still drunk every day, you wear the same clothes every day. If you show up late tomorrow, or if you show up drunk tomorrow, I gotta let you go, all right? So I said, no problem. And I went out that night and got loaded as I always did. So the next morning, I'm supposed to be to work at nine o'clock in the morning. It's about a quarter after nine and I'm rooting through the house looking for my shoes. I can't find my shoes and the phone starts ringing and I pick it up and it's this dude, Jim Kelly. 
And I said, listen, Kel, I can't talk. I'm going to lose my job. I can't find my shoes. He says, you don't have to live like this no more. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I'm talking about AA. He said, Frank, in AA, we're not supposed to say who is or who isn't an alcoholic, but you're an alcoholic. I said, how long you been going to AA? He said, this is my second day. <laughs> so I ended up getting fired from that job. But it seemed to me like over the next couple of years, I would achieve a new low in my life. And the phone would ring, and it was this dude, Jim Kelly. Frank, you're an alcoholic, and you, and you have to go to AA meetings. And I was like, dude, I've been to those meetings. I'm nothing like those people. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not going to AA. And then uh, that day came, you know, when it had nothing to do with the cops or a girl or, or a job. I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was just ashamed of the, the piece of crap that I turned out to be. So much promise, so much opportunity, such a beautiful family. And I was garbage, you know. And I made that call. There was a meeting in Wayne, New Jersey on, on a Monday night. And it was one of those meetings where, uh, the, the meeting was huge. There had to be 60, 70 people in this, in, in this room, big, big circle. And everybody went around the room and introduced themselves. You know, John alcoholic, Bob alcoholic, and so on and so forth. And he came to me and I said, I'm Frank, I'm an alcoholic. And I slipped on in, just slipped on in. And then after that meeting, I got mobbed. New guy sticks out like a sore thumb. And these fellows gave me a big book, and they gave me a meeting list, and they gave me their phone numbers, and they told me to call them every day. And I walked out of that meeting, and I said to myself, I'm not doing none of that stuff. I must have taken that list of phone numbers out of my pocket a hundred times over the next three days, and I'd look at it, and I'd just be like, it's not me. I'm not doing this, you know? And after about the third day, I found myself calling one of those numbers on there, Fella answered the phone. I said, I'm Frank. I met you Monday night. I ain't got nothing to say to you. And he said, not a problem. And he told me where to meet him that night. And that's how it began for me, you know? I hated coming to AA. I hated everybody in the room. None of this stuff applied to me. I have no defects of character. <laughs> Anybody that I did, you know, that I screwed over, they had it coming. You know what I mean? I just drank too much, you know? But, but, but it's funny how, you know, by this time, by just making that one change, by making that phone call and agreeing to call this man every day, and after a couple of weeks, he'd give me another phone number, and he'd say, I want you to call this guy too. And a few weeks would go by, and he'd give me another phone number. So like about a month, two months into it, there's three fellas I'm calling every single day. And the conversations were short. I didn't want to talk to these dudes. But over time, it turns out Jules was a Jet fan. I was a Jet fan. Turns out that Herb was in the motorcycles, I'm in the motorcycles. So a dialogue started to develop, you know what I mean? A dialogue started to develop, you know, but that was key for me, I believe, was, was that willingness to make those calls. The rest of the stuff I didn't want to do, none of this stuff applies to me, I just drink too much, you know? So uh, we're at this meeting in Lincoln Park on a Sunday night and they, they announced that there's a business meeting after the meeting. So Herb comes up to me, he goes, Frank, why don't you hang out after the meeting, come to the business meeting so we, you can see how AA works and what have you. I said, what the hell do I care how AA works? You know what I'm saying? He goes, no, just hang out, stay with us, and just, you know, just, just, just participate in it. You don't have to say nothing, you know? So I'm there at the meeting, and as it turns out that the coffee maker, evidently his job changed his schedule, so they needed a new coffee maker. So this dude goes, I nominate Frank. <laughs> And this other fella says, I second it. And the whole room starts to applaud. I was like, you son of a bitch. That's why you had me stay at this, because you wanted to sucker me into this coffee commitment. He's going, calm down. It's only for two weeks. We have another business meeting, and then we'll elect somebody else to do it. So I said, OK, all right, fine. I'll make the coffee for two weeks. So at the end of two weeks, there's another business meeting. We're sitting there, and this guy raises his hand. And he says, I don't know about the rest of yous, but that Frank makes a goddamn good cup of coffee. And another guy seconded, and everyone started clapping, and he nominated it for three months. So now I'm really pissed off. I had that coffee commitment for five years. <laughs> and I believe that the third time that I was nominated was because I made a goddamn good cup of coffee. You know what I mean? I was like a chemist back there, mixing different blends and stuff. Uh, but, but making those phone calls saved my life. Making that coffee saved my life. 
you know? But still, this stuff don't apply to me. I just drink too much, you know? I was a couple of years into this deal, and uh, I'm on my way to midnight mass with my parents, and I'm having this incredible screaming fight with my mother. And I'm using language that a grown man shouldn't be using towards his mother. And she looked over the seat of the car at me and she said, you know something, you haven't changed one bit, you son of a bitch. And it shut me up because she was right. Now that was probably said to me a hundred times over the course of that two years, but that night I heard it. And I believe that that was the turning point for me in my recovery. And that's when I took responsibility for my recovery. You know, like, just looking back, I was at a meeting once and this old woman was sharing, she said, I guess that my bottom was my first year in AA, and I was like, no shit. I think it was the first two years for me. I was miserable. I hated it here, but I drank myself out of options. I had no place left to go, you know? But at that point, there was this fella, uh, he's, he's, dead, he's, dead, he's dead a long time now, Michael Bryan. And Michael Bryan was this guy, when he shared at a meeting, it seemed to me he was sharing just for me. You know what I mean? And when he was at a meeting and he didn't share, I almost wanted my dollar back. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, I, I, I walked up to him one day and I asked him if he would be my sponsor. And he says that he would. He says under a couple of conditions. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to require that you read. And I stood there staring at him. And he says, books. And I'm still staring at him. And he says, small rectangular objects. And I said, I know what a book is. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyways, I had gotten a big book that uh, first meeting that I went to in Wayne. And I had this apartment in Bayonne. And the door to the kitchen, there was a draft. And the door would blow closed, right? So when the door would blow closed, the dog couldn't get into the kitchen to get to his food and his water. So that big book was the perfect size to prop that door open. So I dropped it on the floor and didn't pick it up again for two years. You know, and Mike took me through the book, he took me through the steps, and um, he explained it to me like I was two years old. And that's pretty much how you had to talk to me. You know what I mean? Like, in the first step as far as being powerless over alcohol, I could see that once I pick up a drink, I could not say with any degree of certainty what was going to happen, where I was going to end up. But the unmanageability, I had difficulty with that. Because my life was my life. I thought I had everything down. There's a paragraph in the doctor's opinion that says, even though they admit it is injurious, it gets to a point where the alcoholic cannot differentiate the truth from the false. The alcoholic life is the only one who knows. It's all I knew. Like looking back, the first time I got thrown in the back of a police car, there was nothing I wouldn't have done to get out of that jam. After five or six times, I'm kicking it back there, bro. First time I lost a job, it was the end of the world. Five or six times, no big deal. Girlfriend, eviction, you can just go down the list. Like all of these things became normal for me. This stuff was abnormal, you know? The little successes in early, in early sobriety, you know, they had to be pointed out to me. I guess about four months into this deal, I was at this, uh, at this, like, this, this gratitude meeting in Pompton Plains and what have you. And this guy was going on and on about being grateful for his fingers and his toes. And I was like, I've had enough of this crap. And I got up and I, and I started you know, walking out of the room. And my sponsor came running out in the parking lot after me. And I said, listen, dude, this is working for you. And I think that's great. But it's not me. You know what I mean? Like, all this stuff is not me. I can't see how it's going to help me. You know, with the you know, different you know, circumstances that I have in my life at that time. And he says, Frankie, he says, since you've been coming to AA, you ain't missed one day of work. He said, since you've been coming to AA, your rent is paid. Since you've been coming to AA, your clothes are clean. Since you've been coming to AA, you haven't spent one night in jail. And I said, yeah. And I went back into the meeting with him. You know what I mean? Like, just by not drinking and going to AA, my life had changed so much. You know what I mean? But I had to start changing this. I had to start changing that. 
and that's where this stuff came in for me. You know what I mean? A power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. The greatest power greater than myself in the history of my life was alcohol. You know, non-human power was alcohol. I worshipped it, I sacrificed it, I did penance for it. Whatever it took, I was willing to sacrifice everything for drinking and drugging, you know what I mean? So if a power greater than myself can reduce me to sanity, it's not that hard for me to be willing to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. You know what I mean? So like that was the willingness that was missing in the beginning that I was able to muster up after a couple of years of just white knuckling it, man. Just white knuckling it. Going through the steps, working with new people, making an effort of prayer. I'm living this life, I'm sponsoring guys. You know what I mean? It was a Sunday morning. I was at Resnick's Hardware in Bayonne paying my phone bill. It's online with all the other old ladies, you know? And I walk out onto Broadway and the sun is shining in my face and the birds are chirping and the trees are in bloom and people are on their way to St. Vincent's for mass. People coming out of the Broadway diner have to have breakfast. And I was like, what is that? You know what I mean? You know, I could, I could feel this thing. And what it was, it was nothing. It was nothing. And it was the first time in my life I ever felt that. See, all my life there was some anxiety, some degree. Sometimes it was great, sometimes it was small, but it was always there. I was a little jammed up about something. And at that, that moment, that Sunday morning, there was nothing there. It was peace. You know, and I believe that that's what my spiritual awakening was, was that inner peace that I have all the time. Now, I have an ex-wife and three teenage kids, so like I could sideways any moment, any day, but I know what to do to get back to that peace. You know what I mean? And, and it's a wonderful thing. Like in the big book at the appendix two, it talks about spiritual awakening and spiritual experience. So some of us have sudden and profound upheavals in personality, but for the most of us, it's of the educational variety, where little things are revealed over time. You know what I mean? And that's how it's been for me. These little, like, learning experiences, you know, that, that has to be God. It has to be God. You know, so, um, Life's going on, uh, I'm, I'm living a sober lifestyle, I'm associating with sober people, we're going to conventions, well, we're going on camping trips. I went in 96, I went to the 50th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous in Ireland. In 95, I went to the 60th anniversary out in San Diego. Um, I was uh, answering phones at Intergroup. We had a substation in Wallington, New Jersey, and every Wednesday night from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I'd answer phones. And that was an incredible experience. And like back then, like the internet wasn't what it is now. So um, like a lot of the information that you would want as far as events and what have you in AA, you'd call in an intergroup and we'd tell you about it, you know? Conventions throughout the country, dances, picnics, things of that nature, right? So we get in this, uh, this flyer for this convention out in uh, San Francisco. So I send it over to Jimmy Kelly. Jimmy Kelly, he was like a, a wife. I would send him this stuff. He would make all the arrangements, airfare, hotel, rent the car. I'd just show up on the, at the airport and get on the plane. I did nothing. He did everything, right? So he filled out and he signed us up to participate in this convention, right? So the convention committee sees that these three guys from Jersey are heading out to, their, uh, to participate in their convention out there in uh, San Francisco. So they contact Kelly and they said, you know, it'd be really cool if one of you guys spoke at our convention, you know? And he said, no problem, Frankie will do it. Kind of like you, right? <laughs> he did the same thing. So uh, anyways, but he doesn't tell me this, right? So we're flying out there, we're probably like over to Rockies or something. I woke up from a nap. I said, so Kel, tell me, what's up? What are we doing tomorrow? You know, because he'd have like, things like massages lined up, you know, like all kinds of cool stuff, you know? And uh, 
He's telling me about the day, and he goes in the evening, there's a big banquet, a dinner dance, what have you, and uh, the banquet, there's gonna be uh, you know, a meeting during the dinner. And I was like, wow, a meeting during the dinner? What's the format of the meeting? He says, there's three speakers, and you're one of them. <laughs> so at first I thought he was just pulling my leg, but when we got to the hotel, there was this big placard outside of the, the, uh, the ballroom, and there it was, Frankie B, Jersey City, you know? So anyways, uh, while everyone else was enjoying the festivities of the convention, I was up in my room, uh, having a nervous breakdown about having to speak in front of 2,500 people. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience, and they all were great experiences. No, they were all great experiences. Like I said, I did not want to be here. I hated AA. I hated everybody in the room. And that uh, transitioned to loving AA and, and, and loving everyone in the room. And just the, the realization of how important you know, AA um, is it to my sobriety. You know, I uh, had a shop in Jersey City for 25 years and I had to shut it down, you know, and I had to get a job. And uh, the job that I got, the, the owners thought I was too old and too stupid to be able to catch on and, and, and do the kind of work that, that, that this job required. And a buddy of mine was uh, petitioning them to try to get me on, you know. So uh, finally he kicked up enough dust that they said, okay, we'll hire him, but you'll fire him. And he said, not a problem, you know. So like part of going in there, they gave me the crappiest schedule possible. And I think they did that trying to get me to quit, you know, which I didn't do. So I was working till 9 o'clock every night. So I stopped going to meetings. I had to get my kids ready for school in the morning and I had to go into work. Didn't get out till nine. Meetings are over by that time, right? So I guess about six months into this thing, eight months into this thing, like I would do my morning meditation, you know, thank God for another day of sobriety, bless my children, that kind of stuff. But this one day, about eight months into it, I'm driving into work and the, I, the, the thought pops into my head, at least you ain't thinking about drinking. And I was kind of proud of myself, like, yeah. I'm not going to meetings and such, but at least I ain't thinking about drinking, you know? So a few weeks, a month, what have you, goes by, it happens again. At least you ain't thinking about drinking. And again, I'm patting myself on the back, like, you know what I mean? I got this job, I'm under all this pressure, my, you know, this, this big change in my life, and at least I ain't thinking about drinking. It got to a point where I was thinking about how I wasn't thinking about drinking constantly. Right? And like this disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And cunning means skills and achieving ends by means of deception or evasion. Sometimes my disease says pick up a drink. You know what I mean? Sometimes my disease will tell me I could take something that doesn't belong to me because no, nobody's looking. My disease tries to work me from all different angles. But I realized it that night. And I had to go to my boss the next day and say, listen, got to do something about my schedule. Didn't want to talk to him about having to go to AA meetings. But before I could get a word out, he said to me, Frankie, we are so impressed with your performance. What schedule is it that you want? So my schedule became Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 and weekends off. I ain't never had a job in my life where I had weekends off. I almost started to cry. But anyways, it got fixed that day and I started getting back into the rhythm of going to AA meetings. You know what I mean? But it's always been clear to me that this is the key, like the steps, a big part of it. Prayer, a big part of it. But the meetings are the biggest part of it for me. You know what I mean? That constant connection and being around people like me. People who know how I feel. People who've been through what I've been through. You know what I mean? Like our stories might be completely different, but I know how you feel. And you know how I feel, how I felt and how I feel today and what the opportunities are. You know what I mean? Um, I had three beautiful children in, in sobriety. Um, nothing like me. I got two 17 year old sons that I am so proud of. When I was 17, I was already in the system. But from what I learned in AA and from my experience in life, I directed them away from that path. You know what I mean? And that I owe to AA. I learned how to be a parent in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? I learned how to be a son in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
to be an employee, to be just a citizen. I learned all that stuff from you folks. You know, so um, anyway, thank you so much for uh, sandbagging me and having me come up here and, <laughs> and speak. To totally unprepared. It was a great experience and uh, happy to do it any time for you. Thanks, Frank. You're great job. You know, we, we would have plugged you in for the whole hour, but uh, we don't want to make you work that hard. All right, let's look in the back there. Let's see, uh, we got any slackers? Uh, who do we, Kel, come on up here. Come on. There you go. Let's go. Come on, let's bring Kel in here. You know those guys that like to hide in the back? They always got a good story. Cal, alcoholic, drug addict. Hey, yeah. my, my legs are hurting. I, I worked out, so it's not, I'm not crippled or anything like that. <laughs> but um, I, I was born in the Bronx. I was I come from the Bronx and the Yankees. That was my team. And um, you guys are doing good right now with Phillies. But I remember we had a World Series. The Yankees played the Phils. Some, somebody won, I forget who it was. Nice <laughs> <laughs> no, so anyway, um, I, my, my sober date is July 7th, 2002. Um, I have two home groups down in Jersey. Probably most people don't know where they're at, but um, I don't know what I'm supposed to say right now. This is, this is funny. But um, I, I got sober. It was my third time. And, um, you know, each time that I came to the program, I would relapse and then everything got worse, right? So I'd, be, I'd, I'd wind up like sleeping on people's floors and, you know, houses where I was using and stuff. And um, I had these two little, I have two little, they, they were little back then, but now they're older, but, and um, I, I just wasn't a father, you know? And my father had left me, they left, he left us. So I always promised that I wasn't going to do the same thing. I didn't leave, but I really wasn't there for them, you know, because I was doing my thing. And um, finally, I was, you know, they say sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think somebody said it today. And um, I was. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was overweight. I was, you know, sick all the time. And half of my, you know, I, I, used, I drank, but I also used drugs. And, you know, this side of my face was numb, right? Tearing every day, all day. And um, I just couldn't take it anymore. So the, th this was the third time I, I went to two rehabs and then a recovery house, and that's how I got sober. So the, the last time that um, when, I, when I finally decided to surrender, I guess you could say, um, I went to a recovery house. I went to two rehabs and then a recovery house. And um, at that house, you know, I walked in. My wife drove me to the house, right? And I was begging her to get, to just stop just so I can get a drink or just something, something because I, I couldn't stand being sober. I couldn't stand not having, you know, being myself. I didn't like myself. I hated everything about myself, you know? I just didn't know it then, but I, kn I knew it later on. M once I started going through those steps and, you know, talking to the people in the rooms and stuff like that, it was really helpful. And um, so I was begging her to, you know, just stop. Just, I, I got to get something. She would do anything I told her to do. But this time she was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping you off and you're going to go do what you got to do and I'm done. And I said, all right. And then I went to the house and the, and the guy who was the manager of that house, um, this was 2002. He was um, two years sober, which was like unreal. Like most of the people were a couple of months that ran a recovery house. It wasn't, you know, that, that it wasn't that, uh, what do you call it, whatever. But, um, and he 12 stepped me for an hour. 
You're gonna do this. You're gonna read these books. You're gonna you're gonna go to meetings every day. You're gonna you're gonna go to the meeting when we're done, and you're gonna sit in the front. There's like a hundred people in the room, and you're gonna raise your hand and tell them that you're new. And I and that was the scariest thing I had to do in my life at that time. And I did it. I raised my hand. I said, My name is Callie, and I'm an alcoholic, drug addict, whatever, uh, and I'm new. And they said, Welcome, whatever, and all that. He told me I'm gonna get a sponsor. I got a sponsor. I, basically. I, was, I wasn't left with, I, I couldn't figure it out for myself for the first time in my life. And um, I did whatever they told me to do. To clean up the room, clean up the chairs, put the books away. Whatever they told me to do, I did. Get a sponsor, start doing the step work, whatever that meant back then, because I didn't know. I didn't know anything about AA really, even though I went twice, but I, I sat in the back and I didn't talk to anybody. And. Um, I did everything they told me to do, and, and my sponsor took me through, he started taking me through the steps very early, and um, that third step was, it, it kind of changed me, and it was, I don't know, maybe two months in, I was two months in or something like that, and the, um, that third step, that whole, you know, looking, finding a God or a higher power, whatever, you know, whatever it was back then, it really worked for me. I finally, I grasped something, something, I, I can't really explain it right now, I guess, but, um, and it, it changed my, it started to change my life, so, you, I, you talked about how, you know, you fought it for a long time or whatever, right? I gave into it at first, you know, real quick, I just gave into it because nothing else worked for me, everything, nothing but AA has ever worked for me, nothing, nothing. So when I came into the program, I just was, I said, I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do, and it worked, and it was really good. And um, I'm still sober today. You know, I always say, too, that, like, the worst times in my life, too, was sober. It wasn't when I was, when I was drinking and using drugs. It was while I was sober. And the worst I've ever, the worst things I've ever done, I did while I was sober to other people, to things, you know, g gangs and stuff. I mean, I, I got into a gang while I was sober for many years. I didn't want to drink, I didn't want to use drugs, but I did a lot of awful things, I'll be, I'll be honest. And, um, and that's the times when I wasn't really working the 12-step program, and I wasn't really... There were two years in my recovery where I made maybe one or two meetings a year, you know? And it wasn't because of a job or any type of commitments, it was just because I didn't want to go. I'd rather hang out with the gang. And, um, you know, what happens with all that type of stuff, you know, it's not that good sometimes, but... Um, but today, I, I'm a little bit different now. You know, I just, I, just got, I just got into a relationship that ended, you know, a couple of months ago. And um, I just, um, sick and tired and sick and tired of certain things as well in life that I don't want to deal with anymore. And um, the only thing I can do and the only place I can go is AA. That's the, that's the only thing that ever works for me, everything. Even therapy, I mean, I've been to therapy before, it's, it's good, but it's nothing like Alcoholics Anonymous. It's nothing like AA. And uh, when you start working the 12 steps again for the one millionth time, um, it still works. And it works almost, I want to say perfectly, if, you, if I do it. And uh, I think I'm done. My, my legs are shaking, I, 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 you know, I'm getting hurt. Who do we got? We got like four and a half minutes left. Tim, you're going to have to be our closer. Come on up here. Let's call up Tim. He's always got something. Just for the record, Tim's our resident photographer. So all those great pictures are all thanks to Tim. Let's welcome him. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Tim, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you, Ron, for asking me to speak. Um, love is saying yes to what is. I heard that quote. And I know um, I appreciate the welcome, but I, I'm always told to, to stay current. And today, um, there was a sponsee of mine, Joe Scollins, who's one of our brothers in this program. Um, he had um, diagnosed him with pancreatic cancer in January. And um, 
You know, I remember he said to me, Tim, like, I'm holding on, brother. Just take, and I offered to take him to uh, chemo every week. And I took him to chemo every week for six, for six months. And it turned on him. And we had a lot of car rides together. You know, we got a lot of times where we weren't saying anything to each other. We, we can experience the love that we had for one another, you know. And today was his service. And he asked me to, to put the service together. And he asked me to put the service together with uh, the pastor of the church that we both belong to and play to. I'm a musician, I'm, I'm the band director of the church. And I always, in those car rides and, and taking them to the hospital, and picking them up, I always thought that I had to have something really profound to say or something that was, you know, that was gonna rock them or make it better. And what you guys taught me was to show up. You know, just show up. Just say yes. You know, man? And I found myself today meeting his children for the first time because it was a little broken, but the gratitude that they had in their eyes, that they saw the AA family that came to the church and to the church that rallied around him when he was sick. They were so happy, and all that brokenness seemed to be congealed in, in a moment that I've never seen, and I can't really explain that to you right now, what that means to me, because some things are sort of above language, and what this program does, and what God can do for me, for us, that I can't do for myself, is show up and be there for somebody else other than myself because I have the disease of alcoholism and all I did was do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. You know, and I, and I couldn't believe that I could actually be asked to do something like that for a brother. You know, um, Bill Wilson always talked about service being like it what you want it to be. How can you be there for the next person? You know, and the gifts, the book talks about limitless expansion, right? It talks about the freedom, the peace, you know, and the work, living those steps. It's changed me so much. In the book it says, oh, there is one who has all power. The power is God may you find him now, right? Because God is in the now. I'm sure you've heard God is in the pause. Because he's in this moment. He's in this breath. He's in this emotion. And I can't believe I can stand up here and be there in this emotion with you now. Considering where I was. You know, how beautiful is that? So I love you, Joe. And um, thanks for everybody for showing up and saying yes tonight, for being here and sitting in those seats. Because as Frank was saying, it, this is, it's about connection. My whole life, all I did was try to push everybody away. And that puts distance between you and me, and that puts distance between you and me and God. And no wonder I feel like crap, and I'm anxious, and I'm isolated. And this is about getting closer to, to one another. And saying yes. Love is saying yes to what is. And uh, I think that's all I have. My name's Harry, and I'm an alcoholic. My name's Nick, I'm an alcoholic, and thank you so much, everybody. Uh, that was excellent. We, we, uh, we find a way, right? I mean, we're the most resourceful, um, you know, charismatic people I've ever met, and a lot of the rehab and stuff I've been, I've met some of the most intelligent, charismatic, and beautiful people and, on the inside, and, and I see that in everybody now, and it's, it's an awesome thing. And, um, you know, we don't have a, a, a single, singular speaker to thank, but um, thank you all for your attendance, and thank you for those who did speak. There's tons of food. I mean, please help yourselves so whatever you can take home. Uh, nothing, nothing to go to waste. Please stay in fellowship with us. And um, we have a beautiful way to close. We'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. 